The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, we remember before you all persons whom it would be easy for us to forget, the homeless and the destitute, the old and the sick, and all who have none to care for them. Help us to heal those who are broken in body or spirit and to turn their sorrow into joy. Grant this, Father, for the love of your Son, who for our sake became poor, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Good morning. I'm glad that you're here and uh, glad that you're able to, uh, to engage with um, uh, Deacon Barbie Click. Uh, I don't need to introduce her to many of you, but some of you may not have had a chance to, um, uh, to hear her or to be around her. Um, Barbie is the, uh, the manager of the food pantry at uh, Trinity uh, Church in the Central West End, um, which is the place where, um, Penny, can you hold up the bag? that you have is the place where all of these filled bags go um, after, uh, after they're brought in. And uh, Bill and Jim Gilbert um, are responsible for helping to make sure that those are delivered. So that's this, she is the, the manager of that, of that pantry. If you've not had a chance um, at some point to go down and visit, I encourage you to, uh, to do so. It is an impressive, uh, impressive operation, and Barbie does a very, very fine job in helping to lead that ministry. She is also what is called one of the missioners in our diocese. Um, and she is the missioner for what is known as Jubilee Ministries, and I'll let her say a little bit more about that. Um, but it's a, a privilege for me to be able to introduce uh, Barbie to, to you again. And uh, Barbie, thank you so much for being here uh, thank you. once again. Welcome thank to St. Peter's. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. It is really special to be here with you all again. I love it. Um, you all are so instrumental and, and vital to the ministry at Trinity uh, Food Ministry, which is not just a pantry, but it is several different things, which I'll go over with you in the slideshow today. I've got a lot of pictures and a lot of information about exactly what we do. So that beginning with that, here we go. So what do we do? We love people. Four times a week. Pantry is on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, Tuesday is a, often a chaotic, crazy day because there's a lot of stuff coming in, a lot of uh, donations coming in, but, um, and, and uh, then the people start gathering around sometimes 10 o'clock in the morning to uh, be there first for when the pantry opens at 1.30. So then Thursday from 4 to 5, we also have the Wednesday Cafe, which is a meal only, meal and conversation, which everyone is invited to. Every one of you, every one of the people in the community, we normally have anywhere between about 10 to 20 people that show up. And it, one day I was in there and there were quite a few people and it was so noisy. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, this noise is driving me nuts. And then I thought, oh wait, that's like a cafe. So it had actually come into its own idea of being a cafe. Everybody was eating, drinking their coffee, having a good time talking. So it was just a wonderful thing. And then we also have the Sunday hot lunch of which many of you are familiar because you do this six times a year, right? We have a lot of partnerships. St. Peter's is one of the most important par uh, partnerships, but we have other ones too. And often it still isn't quite enough. Or maybe I should say it's always enough, but we get down to that point where it feels like we're starting to lean into our scarcity. So it's kind of scary sometimes. So we have parishes, churches, and synagogues, a synagogue. St. Peter's, as I said, six times a, a year, plus these monthly donations. That is, you cannot, I cannot, I cannot stress how important these donations are. It always seems to come at a time when the, the food that we buy is running low and we can't, there's some reason why we can't get more 
There's always, uh, it always comes at a time when our shelves are empty and you fill our shelves back up and you give us what we need to be able to give it to the people who come in to shop. You also do the new shoes for the uh, Linton uh, foot ministry the day before Monday, Thursday. And then Advent, Christmas, and Lent. Dudley has been instrumental, as I'm sure several of you working with her, in getting us coats and hats and winter clothing this past winter. Or this, I, we're still in winter, aren't we? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the 80 degree temperatures kind of fooled me. But anyway, we also have uh, Church of St. Michael and St. George, Holy Communion, Grace, Timothy Saint, uh, Timothy's uh, Creep Corps, and then we also, St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox, the Central Reform Congregation, St. Paul's UCC Afton, First Unitarian Church CWE, and First Church of Christ Scientists. All of these give something. They don't always give quite as much, but in their own way, they're just as important. So it's vitally important. And then Whole Foods CWE. If you ever go to Whole Foods in the Central West End, please tell them thank you for supporting the Trinity Food Ministry because they are vital to our, uh, sometimes it's feast, sometimes it's famine, but it's always something more than what we had. And then we have McMurphy Construction. They're the ones doing the, uh, if you're familiar with the Queenie Tower mm -hmm. that came down, well, they're the ones that are building it back up. Philip Johnson Salon, which is also in the uh, Central West End, and Macy's Department Store. So we have lots of donors. Oh. And I can't forget Old Bonham School. That is the most awesome school. They are, I don't care which year it is, those fourth graders are so motivated and so uh, enthusiastic about everything that they do. And they give us one of our largest food drives. And it's once a year and it's just before Thanksgiving. And, and I need to tell about the pantry because I haven't actually, before COVID, um, it was a, Here's your bag. Take it. Thank you. See you later. And we would give them a bag according to what size family they had, whether it's one person or whether it's ten. So we would choose. You know, it's like, well, kids like peanut butter, right? Kids like cereal, right? After COVID, well, before COVID, we had over 50 volunteers each week that participated in one way or the other, either on the backside or the front forward facing to... Um, the people who came in. During COVID, in the first days, it dropped to eight of us doing the setup and the actual giveaway. We did not miss one single Sunday as far as hot lunch is concerned, and we only missed one week of pantry. We were considered an essential, um, what did they call it? Uh, well, anyway, we were considered essential workers, I guess. So. Therefore, we were allowed to go ahead and continue on with the pantry. Um, when we came back from COVID, I was able to realize uh, what I had wanted to do for a long time, which was create a choice ministry. So now people come in and they register and then they go to the bread, they get their, the, they choose which canned meat they want. Then they go to the bread table and get whatever we have. And then there's another station and a cold food station, perishable foods. And then there's desserts. And then there's another table. And then there's toiletries. And then we, we have the Narcan table, which is a harm reduction. Um, we have a, you know, as every place uh, has right now, there's always a problem with uh, opioid overdose. If anybody's been in the hospital lately for a major, for a major surgery, uh, where you needed painkillers uh, to pay, uh, to alleviate the pain, you probably were given a, can a box of Narcan. So that's what we give away at Pantry for people who live with the potential of someone in their lives possibly overdosing. So it saves lives. So anyway, that's just a that's a, uh, a bird's eye view into what the pantry is. It, we're total 100% uh, choice pantry now which is really awesome because we're no longer assuming what people need or want. We may not have everything they want, but everything they get is a choice that they have made. It's set up in a way that they can come through with carts. Yeah, that we have carts and they take their carts around and they shop. 
But that's not all we do. We have other things too, of which some of y'all are very familiar. We have the foot ministry. We have foot baths. People come in and they just soak. The first year that we were going to do it, I thought, oh, nobody's going to want to let us touch their feet. They're going to want to do their own foot baths and everything. One person said no. And then he ended up changing his mind <laughs> when he saw everybody else going, ah. <laughs> So that guy on the left there is Derek, and he, he, he's a good guy. He's, uh, he's one of our regulars. I've known him for quite a few years. Uh, he's working hard to try to get his life in order. And this is uh, on the right. It's uh, our, our deaconess faith nurse. She's there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then she and um, her coworker show up on, for the foot ministry. And they do the pedicures, the wound care, and um, whatever else needs to be taken care of. Because feet, when you're walking on them all day long, how many in here have foot problems? <laughs> Me too. Can you imagine walking everywhere you need to go? And you're walking in shoes that someone gave you, so they were already formed to somebody else's feet. You may or may not have socks, or maybe the socks you have on, you've had on for three or four days. I know one man who did not take his boots off for over two weeks. And he didn't do that because he had a really nice pair of boots. And if he had taken them off, someone would have stolen them. And so he kept those boots on his feet laced up, which means when he took his shoes off, his socks were stuck to his feet and his skin just sloughed off. I'm sorry, whoever's eating. But it was quite horrible. It was, it was really sad. But that's the type of condition that people have. And they don't have clippers. A lot of the people don't have clippers. So they're not able to do their own feet, take care of their nails and all. And they're walking in the weather. And they're walking, their feet are wet, their feet are sweaty, their feet are um, in shoes that don't work right, fit right. These, these are my two Michaels, Michael in the foreground and Michael in the background there. Yeah. Kelly was here at St. Peter's, right? Yeah, so y'all may recognize Kelly. And that's, uh, I think this is from the first year. Where is it? Right here, this picture. That's from the first year. Uh, that's not very many shoes compared to what y'all have given in the last few years that we've done this. So... I think there was like 75 pair the first year, and the, uh, you've given right at 100 to a little bit over 100 um, in the past couple of years. Oops. Bad. Another thing that we did this year, uh, something that I wanted to do for a couple of years but didn't have the emotional energy to do it, um, the International Opioid Awareness Day. And it was a day, uh, August 31st, it's a day to remember people who have died from opioid overdose. So it's just a day to name them. It's a day to um, remember. And it's a day to, uh, in that awareness, to um, just be able to say, this is something we can overcome. This is something that can, there, we can help with this. And it affects everybody. It doesn't have anything to do with people who are homeless or people who are poor. It affects everybody. There, I remember the first time we started hearing about heroin overdoses, and it was in um, a, a posh area of Dallas, Texas. And there was a huge, where all these teenagers suddenly died from overdose. And it was just a bad batch of heroin that was whatever. I don't know what the problem was because that was 20 some odd years ago. But this is a serious condition, and Narcan is not an enabler. It is a lifesaver. It allows the people who have overdosed to make a new decision the next day. Our son died of an accidental overdose in 2021, and, if, and he, was, he was slated to go into rehab. He was working on being able to go into a rehab for alcohol, but he had one last bender. And that's all it takes. It's one last mistake. Anyway, he died from overdose. And if he had had someone with him, 
someone who had Narcan, he would have been able to live and make a new decision the next day. So that's what Narcan does. So if you hear anybody that says Narcan is an enabler, they're wrong. We have some here at St. Peter's. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. 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 We, at the same deal, um, well, here's some facts. 2021, of which our son was one of these, 107,000 people died from drug overdose. Um, in 2022, 1,577 Missourians died. And those weren't all poor people. Those weren't all rich people. They weren't all anything. They were just people. This was the wall of memory. It, it was much larger than this, <laughs> but that's just a close-up. People were able to put the names of uh, their loved ones or people that they knew. And then afterwards, we had the blessing of the Narcan Life Box. Now, this took a minute for me to be able to talk the vestry of Trinity to, do, to allow this to be done. But they finally said yes. And so there it is. We fill it up with Narcan, uh, and uh, we fill it up like every other day. Yeah, one of the people that um, does this ministry, that takes care of it, she one day was going out there to put more boxes in, and she found um, two empty boxes, and she found someone's coat up on top of the life box, and somebody had had an overdose, and they needed, you know, two, three <coughs> attempts to try to save, and I guess they found them, they were able to save them, because... All that was left was the coat, so they must have been able to get them on where they needed to be. Wednesday Cafe. Now this really, I sort of did this selfishly because um, before COVID, we had pantry three days a week. Well, when we came back from COVID, because we had the choice, we didn't really need three days of pantry. But I thought, we need something. So we developed this. It's just a cafe. You come in, there's a simple meal, there may be soup, um, or there may be fried egg sandwiches, whatever the cooks decide they wanna do that day. And there's no pantry, there's no giveaways of anything, it's just come in, get a meal, sit down if you want to, or you go if you want to. But it's just a nice place to be for a couple of hours each day, each week. And as I told St. Michael and St. George last Tuesday when I was there, I tell you, too, you're all invited. If you have a Wednesday free, come by and check it out. Just come and be. Come and see. Come and see. <laughs> then we also had, have the uh, Thanksgiving Day gratitude meal. Now, this is something really special. It started out because um, the lady who did most of the cooking for Trinity Food Ministry, because we have meals at each one of the pantries, so the lady who did the cooking on the three days of pantry, she said, I want to give back. She said, I want to, I want to do a Thanksgiving Day meal. What do you think? And I thought, Thanksgiving Day? I don't want to be here on Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> but then she talked me into it, and other, other volunteers were willing to do it, and I thought, okay, let's do it. So we started talking around, and we got someone to donate some turkeys. We got another guy who in the neighborhood who smoked the turkeys. She made all the side meals. And we had about 70 people that first time show up. And then we had the one during COVID, but it was a to-go type thing. So then this year, we, I think this was our fourth year. But anyway, it was uh, really a fabulous event. It took many days for many volunteers because we didn't have that one cook anymore. She didn't, that one chef, she was not able to, she's not there with us anymore. But anyway, it took many days to prepare. So these are just some of them. And then this was the actual day. And you can see all those pies. <laughs> Laughing Bear Bakery, if you bought one pie, they would donate one pie to us. And so Laughing Bear, if anybody's familiar with Laughing Bear, they have some really beautiful pies. Um, this is just the bigger scene. We had people from all over the diocese. We had a lot of people from uh, Michael and George. We had uh, some people from St. John's at Tower Grove. 
Um, we had himself, the bishop, and Jalong. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is Anthony. He's a super sweet guy. And uh, Matt, this guy right here, he is one of our, he started a Wash U program. Um, he's a third year, um, uh, I don't know what, how you phrase it, but anyway, he's becoming, he's a doctor. Uh, and he's third year med student, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, he started, he got it okay through Wash U that the Wash U students who are supposed to do some sort of uh, charity work, that they will come and work at uh, Trinity Food Ministry. So they either work on the, during the, the week at one of the pantries or Sunday hot lunch. Right now most of them are doing Sunday hot lunch. So Matt uh, got that taken care of so that we are approved as one of the spaces for them to do their work. And they are a bonus, they are amazing people. So one of the things, we were at a diocesan leadership retreat yesterday, um, different groups that are leaders in the diocese. And one of the things that we were talking about at our table was uh, relationship building. It's always about relationship. Why are you gathered here today? Why do you come to church every Sunday? Why do you come to these breakfasts? It's to be with one another, right? It's to learn a little bit about one another. It's to claim a friendship or a camaraderie or a commonality. It's something that you do to just be bits, to be a part of something bigger than yourself. And that's what this food ministry is all about. It's all about building relationship. Building a relationship with people who look a little bit different than us. Uh, but they may think differently than we do. They may act differently. They may have different circumstances, whether they are underhoused or unhoused. It doesn't matter because we have commonalities. We are loved by God. We all belong to God alone, right? It's always about learning to love in that God love. And love is the only reason we exist. If God didn't love us, what would we be? So how can we do anything except love as God loves? And that's what the food ministry is all about. We may not be able to change the world. We may not ever be able to. But we can, I can, I can act and see differently. I can act and feel differently. I can change me. And when I change me, the world around me changes. We change how we love. I had a little incident. It actually was ongoing. I had this, we were at loggerheads. It was with uh, um, someone that I have to work with at Trinity. And uh, it was just like, I can't keep on doing this. I'm using up all my energy and I don't have that much energy. I've got to save it. I've got to, so, you know, I had two choices. I had, I could keep on doing what I was doing and wear myself out, or I could turn around and walk away. Actually, there's three choices because I could change how I was reacting to her. I could change how I dealt with her. I could become a listener instead of a talker. I could become, just be more aware of where she was coming from. And it changed our entire relationship. It, it, it's just an example of how we are constantly being asked to listen and act differently, to feel differently. We're at, and it all begins right here with each individual person. And so that's what this is all about. We can change how we love, but we have to start right here with us. That's the end of that. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions about the food ministry? Because it's not just a pantry, it's an entire ministry.
Uh, what's going on with the food truck? <laughs> well, now that's a different hat. <laughs> Um, the food truck is uh, in the process of ironing out some little aggravating um, things, but our, we were scheduled on March 2nd to uh, have our first uh, actual outing at Crash Crash Cathedral. We're going to start having Saturday mornings there, and it's from 10 to 11.30, and we'll be serving whoever comes up. So we'll have teams. The cathedral, I think, has enough people where they are going, enough people interested, at least at this moment, where they're going to do the first, third, and fifth Sundays. They'll have teams for those days. Uh, we still have the second and fourth Sundays that are open. If anybody ever wants to like delve into something totally different and uh, be at the cathedral on Saturday mornings at nine o'clock, uh, once a month. But anyway, so we'll be. We'll be making. Uh, we had a we had an incident at Trinity Food Ministry. Um, what two three weeks ago? The there was a snafu in the scheduling, and it was really ultimately my fault because this group normally shows up on the fourth Sunday. Well, they whatever the scheduling thing, it had them on the first Sunday, and so you know life goes on, right? And gets in the way and you don't think about things that's not in your norm. So they forgot. Well, they're so dependable that it was 15 till 2, which we start at 2. It was 15 till 2 when I finally listened to the volunteers going, there's no food, there's no food. And I'm going, oh my gosh, there's no food. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to quickly assess what do we have that we can feed the 30 people that are already gathered outside and more coming. And so I thought, we have eggs, we have bread, we have peanut butter and jelly. So my wife, Debbie, being my perfect other half, <laughs> jumps in and starts frying eggs. One of the, the people from Trinity was, that was there, he starts in, he started, he started doing the same thing. So they started doing these fried egg sandwiches. And uh, then we, uh, another uh, person that was there for the day started throwing together peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and so they were on the griddle. They were doing these fried egg sandwiches and these fried, uh, the grilled, yeah. grilled, grilled peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And that's what we serve. And I was dealing with the people here. With, uh, Sam, Brother Sam, my assistant, was <coughs> making sure everybody had what they needed to drink. And so I was taking orders and trying to ease everybody into, yes, it's going to take a minute. <laughs> so, but we served 65 people in 45 minutes. And, and that they was, are our signature sandwiches on the truck. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was an answer to the truck. That's what we're going to be doing on the truck. She got practice. <laughs> she got practice for March the second. <laughs> so, um, I'm just. Uh, how do you? What are the symptoms of an opioid overdose, and how is Narcan administered? A uh, symptom of opioid overdose is absolutely no response. Somebody is lying there, and they look like they're dead. And basically, I guess they are, because if you leave them, they will be dead. Um, you, know the, you know the sternum rub? I forgot what it's called, but anyway, there's that. You do like that, and if there's no response with that, because that supposedly brings people up out of a faint or any other type of thing. So you do it just really hard. And if they don't respond, then you administer Narcan, because you can't hurt anybody with the Narcan. And it's either an injectable that you inject into the thigh, or it's um, um, uh, like a nasal mist type thing, and you just squirt it up their nose. The one shot, one one nostril. If they don't do anything, then you do you do the second shot up, you know, so in their nostril breathing. again. I'm sorry. They are breathing. It, they if they are they are not breathing. You're supposed to there there comes a little um, uh, mouth protector thing where you can give mouth to mouth resuscitation too. But no, they are not breathing, and you want to. And it's not something they're going to thank you for either because they just wasted money on a, something that was keeping them from being very sick. And so they immediately go into that dope sickness again, which is a very painful, bone-burning, gut-wrenching, horrible, horrible thing. Um, it is uh, dope sickness from fentanyl especially is extremely intense. So they will, you know, and, and after you administer, you're supposed to be calling 911. So 
Um, that's basically, but, but, the, but the Narcan normally will work. Uh, you have to stay with them because the, while the Narcan will work, they can also relapse and because the overdose can be more than what the Narcan was. So that's the reason why you call 911. So it's pretty traumatic for everybody. <laughs> Anybody else got a question? Yeah. What's the percentage of fentanyl? In the dose? It's just, it, oh, in the market itself? Almost everything. They say they've tested um, even the marijuana. Uh, not in not in the dispensaries, but you know, just because we made it legal doesn't mean that it, you know, stopped being on the street for sale. So even the marijuana that is for sale on the streets is laced with fentanyl. Now the thing about that is that it only hurts you if you do it use it in the edibles, like you eat it, you ingest it somehow, because the when you light it on fire, it burns the fentanyl up. So. You're, you're not going to risk necessarily uh, a fentanyl overdose. But fentanyl is everywhere. It's everywhere. They had, there is no such thing as clean heroin here, if you can have clean heroin. But anyway, there's no such thing as clean heroin here in St. Louis area, St. Louis Metroplex. Uh, crack cocaine. The, you know, I know people who would use crack because they said it would, didn't have to worry about overdose. Well, you do now because I know someone who's in a uh, uh, nursing home now because he was, uh, he overdosed on fentanyl by smoking crack. And so it, you know, it's just, it's deadly. It's deadly. And this isn't the fentanyl that you get in your, uh, you know, if you've just had major surgery or if you're in the hospital. This is a synthetic fentanyl and uh, it is just, it's deadly. That's just all there is to it. And it doesn't take anything at all. It's just a minutia. Oh. Um, I've been thinking about the, the shoe drive for mm -hmm. this year, and mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to get a little bit of guidance on sizes. And I, I think it was ten size 10 or 10 and a half for men, and I didn't know if there were ladies Shoes, the major, the not major, the um, majority, thank you, I knew it was an M word. <laughs> um, the majority, uh, the, the most average size is 10, 10 and a half, 11. Okay. Uh, but Dudley brought in a pair of 16 wides the other day because that guy that I showed you on the picture there, he has a 16 wide. So, and he's not alone, there's others too. And then I got uh, Mike who has, he wears an eight and a half. So, uh, so we've got anything. The majority, uh, I asked for the majority of the sizes to be between 10 and 12 because that's where we need most. And really even between nine and 11. So anywhere you hit in that what frame about, will work. What about women's shoes or do you even have a need for those? I, uh, most of the, the people, let me back up here. The Trinity Food Pantry caters mostly to people who are housed, who have uh, jobs, who have cars, or they ride the bus. Um, that's the majority. So we have a handful of people who are uh, uh, probably 15% uh, of the people that we serve are actually unhoused or unsheltered. So those are the ones that we're mostly concerned with. And, and while we have a lot of women who would love to have shoes, they're not the ones that we're catering to. This is a, this is a foot ministry for those people who are uh, actually out walking everywhere they go and have the least amount of resources and the least likelihood. Uh, there are programs for women, there are programs for children, but there aren't very many programs for men especially black men who are between the ages of 20, 30 and 50. They're just darn. Okay. They're, they're out there on their own. And unless they have a mental health problem, unless they have a drug addiction, it's just tough. Okay. It's really tough. All right, thanks. But regarding, you're talking about some of them have cars and what have you. You're talking about some of the people that have cars and what have you. It's, it's, it's not that, uh, 
So these people have like two and three jobs trying to make right. ends meet. They're not just everyday folks that can, you know, already afford the right. food and what have you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. When I first got, uh, was introduced to Trinity, I guess I just didn't really know what to expect. <laughs> and when you talked about unhoused or people in, in with problem situations and stuff like that, it was sort of fearful to me. But I've been down there quite a few times, you know, helping out, mostly handing out resources, well, the coats and stuff that we collected from Burroughs last year, and they're going to let us do it again this year. Um, I mean, they seem to be kind, they're helpful, they're respectful, they're quiet. Um, they seem to be fairly orderly. They know exactly where their place's line is, uh, and, but they're but they're calm about it. So it's not you know if you worry about going down to the unhoused, unhoused, don't be worried. It's a it's a very um, kind of a kind, calm place. I see Charlie kind of shaking his head. Charlie goes and and um, we we've, we had lots of people. Um, John, everybody has been helping, and we can help again. So the shoe ministry is wonderful. And just you know, you can get online, look up men's sale shoes, and you know, it takes you right to the spot, and you can get some for anywhere from twenty to twenty-two, twenty-six dollars a pair. That are really nice shoes. You know, so look, and it's easy to get. They'll mail them right to you. And uh, if you're looking for any of the opportunities, you know, we have a lot of opportunities. Bill does one at St. John's. It's a great place, and, and, and St. Trinity. Peter's is needed and, and effective. Yeah. Bill's also, Bill and Jim are also uh, instrumental in being at uh, Trinity mm -hmm. Hot Lunch. So, um, yeah, the, um, Charlie, are you the one that did the email? Who did, no, um, Chris, 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 Chris Knight. Um, yeah, I sent out an email uh, about the foot ministry, and there has been quite a bit of response. It's uh, so I, I, there's several of you that are planning on being there, and have roles already. So that's really amazing and wonderful. And so I appreciate that very much because uh, we've done with relatively few volunteers over the years. So I'm expecting this one to be really well staffed. So I appreciate that. Um, a lot of the people that come to, uh, the, the people that Debbie was talking about who are working, who are, they're working for jobs. They may, a lot of them work in the healthcare uh, industry and uh, that's not a well-paid industry. And they may have three jobs. They're moms in a lot of cases. So in answer to your question about, you know, I mean, there's always, there's always a need. They always have needs, especially for their, their, their children. And so one of the things that happens uh, if we have leftover shoes, I've got a couple of moms that say, do you have any shoes for my sons, the, her teenage sons? And so I always give shoes out to them. So they get some of the new shoes. However, I, you've got one of the things that Debbie was reminding me about is that these shoes mean so much. The, uh, there was one year when I was told, you know, I've never had a brand new pair of shoes that were mine alone that nobody else had ever worn. Mm -hmm. Now that's just, that's hard to imagine for a lot of us. Um, uh, so these shoes mean a great deal. And there are some happy feet <laughs> and happy that people out. that walk out of that place. <laughs> yeah, they do, they do. And they are, they're the, the I mean, that's not to say we don't have problems. I got cussed out last Thursday as a guy stormed out because he was because I wouldn't let him pick up for people that he didn't have permission to pick up from the, as far as groceries. So, you know, I mean, it's not always utopia, <laughs> especially when the moon is full. I don't know what it is that well, I do know, but it's crazy. But anyway, it's just a um, it's a you know, it is a good place to be. They're good people. They're just their lives are obstructed by uh, racism, by uh, unjust ways, by uh, poverty. You know, and there's a difference between poverty and being poor. Poverty is a system that is created to make certain that some people have less and are kept away. I mean, you've got to know that the only reason why you're here in Ladue is because of white flight. 
you fled the city when, not all of you, and I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, but that's the only reason why the suburbs exist. It just is the reality of it. When poverty, when things started, when the white flight in the 70s started in the central West End, the people who left could, and they did. They left, and they went out into the suburbs. With them followed a lot of the churches. With them followed a lot of the grocery stores, all of the grocery stores. Hospitals. Hospitals, yes, hospitals. There's, there's so much. Businesses, they all went out into the county. They went out into the suburbs because that's where the money was and what was left in the city. People who had no choice but to stay there. Now, we've heard that story before. We heard it in New Orleans after Katrina. The people who left did. The people who couldn't stayed. So it's just the way of poverty. Poverty is a system that holds people down and holds people back. And those are the people that I work with a lot. And they are good people. They are good, good people. And some of them have, a, I mean, we can go into the structure of racist uh, systems that have caused all of these problems and talk all day long. But that's just something to remember, that they are just, that it's not that they're victims, it's that the system is oppressive. And it has caused a lot of these problems. So that's why we do what we do, is because at Trinity, um, Trinity Episcopal Church in the 70s, they had a huge decision to make. Do they leave the city or do they stay? Well, a lot of the people actually left. They moved, right? But they made the decision that the church was going to stay and they were going to come back to the church and they were going to... That's when the, that's when the uh, hot lunches, the food ministry itself, started was back in somewhere around 1970. So for 50 years, this is one of the oldest food ministries in the city, uh, especially uh, church related. So it is, it, it is there because it was needed and it's still needed, sadly, even though uh, you, know, you, you look out one direction, you're standing in uh, Trinity, in the South Parish Hall of Trinity, you look out to the uh, south, it's affluence. It's all that district that um, is all built up and a lot of businesses, restaurants. You look out to the north and we're one block from Del Mar and we've got 7-Eleven North Euclid, which is the Roosevelt apartment towers where uh, last summer the elevators went out. <laughs> People were stuck on the 11th floor, unable to get down to get to go get groceries to go get they couldn't walk because they they had wheelchairs or they had walkers or they had any number of problems that disallowed them being able to walk down the stairs so they had neighbors that were just taking I'd, I'd send a whole case of potatoes up there with one of the ones who could walk and could get down and he took it off and distributed food to his neighbors so these are crazy things that don't happen in what we perceive as the real world, but they're common things, these slumlords and all these things that happen. So I could go on forever on this, so I need to hush. <laughs> Barbie, is there any one particular need that you have right now that's not being adequately addressed? So here's the thing, you all, the toilet paper that you give, um, you know, I can talk about toilet paper all day long too, because it's just really hard to imagine not having it when you need it, but there's a lot of people that don't. So uh, we can always use more toilet paper. We can always. We, we try to give away, uh, it, it, this sounds, uh, you know, people can come once every two weeks to the pantry. So for each person, up to uh, six rolls, each person can have one roll, uh, two rolls of toilet paper, up to six. Six is the maximum we give away. But six rolls of toilet paper to, for a family of 10 to last two weeks, that's, you know, sketchy. <laughs> it gets a little. So we always need uh, toilet paper. Um, well, 
chili is something that we buy, but um, our uh, the person that the the group that we buy it from uh, had a super failure to deliver, and so we were out of chili for like a full week. Uh, so we had some emergency stuff come in. Chili is one of those really horrible foods that has like 1,500 um, uh, milligrams of sodium in it, so it's not exactly healthy. But it's one of the popular. It's one of the most popular foods that we get that they choose to take. Um, we always need um, the peanut butter. Um, the things that we, the, that's the things, that's the thing that is so special about you all. I send you a list and you buy what's on that list because what's on that list are the things that we need. Now, we can always use more. We can always use more of exactly what you give. We can always use flour and oil, cooking oil. Uh, just the regular, not the gigantic bottles, but the regular bottles of oil, those type of things. The condiments, the uh, salt and pepper and sugar. Oh, Lordy, I can always use sugar. So there's always those things. So anything that you need that you don't even pay attention to needing in your own house, that's what other people need too. So think as, as you go into your, into your kitchen and, and looking up, what kind of things do I really need? What are the things that I depend upon having all the time? Garlic, salt, pepper, oil, flour, sugar, anything else that you just use constantly. So, And then one more thing, and we need to stop. Uh, I, know, I know this is that other hat, but are there expenses related to the food truck that you're anticipating you're going to need some assistance with? I have come to understand that there is going to be a constant maintenance concern. <laughs> Once upon a time, I was very arrogant about the St. Louis, um, the, the um, whoever does the Metro bus that takes the groceries Back out. Down. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's an old Metro bus. Um, Operation Urban. Food, Urban? Urban Farm. Whoever they are, I was very arrogant. And I'm going to confess this to you all, because each week I would get a text that said, oh, the, the, the bus is not going to be able to go today because it's going in for maintenance, or the bus is not going to be able to be where it's supposed to be today because of yada, yada, whatever. Hmm. Yeah, I totally understand now. We have been thwarted by little things that have kept us from being able to get this food truck out on the streets. But um, so there's always going to be uh, money concerns. There's always going to be a need for maintenance. There's always going to be a need for fuel. So if anybody wants to give fuel cards, like to Quick Trip or Costco or Sam's, because we have Costco and Sam's um, uh, memberships. So any of those type of things, anywhere we might um, be a common type place to be able to, we could always use fuel cards. Uh, okay. Thankfully right now, the wiring problem that we have is being taken care of by Dale Penrose from Emmanuel um, and a group of people that he's got together. So that's not costing us anything, which if we would had to take it back to the person who built the truck, um, it would have cost us a lot of time, if nothing else. So. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to make a pitch for the, 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 the food drive, our annual food drive. We have, is a hope, you know by now uh, our goal is 1200 bags uh, we are almost at 20 percent of that goal um, and this is the end of february so i'm hoping that we're going to blow that number up um, but um, there are bags available if you've not already been to church yet there are bags available as you leave today so please uh, please be generous and i want to recognize bill gilbert and jim gilbert um, and thank them for their what they do yes. super thank you and very, very grateful for Barbie being here, for Debbie being here, and for the unbelievable work they're doing every day um, to address the needs and concerns of those in this community. Thank you, Barbie. Thank you all.